Okay, uh, let's uh, let's continue. So we're very happy to welcome today Emily Kaufman. So she's a CNRS researcher based at Université de Lille and in the Crystal team. Uh, she's known for amazing work on the multi armed bandits, and that's what she's going to talk about today. Thank you. Can can everyone hear me in the back? Is the mic okay? Good. Thank you. So I'm, I'm uh, happy to be uh, back at uh, RL, RLSS, which we organized in Lille uh, uh, four, year, four years ago. It's nice to see a big amphitheater of people uh, uh, interested in RL. So uh, you know already experts after three days on uh, RL and deep reinforcement learning. And today we're going to take a step back to one state's uh, MDPs. So Given that the model is much simpler, the expectation will not be the same because in the bandit world, we will actually be able to prove things uh, and we will try to provide non-asymptotic guarantees for the algorithm that I will describe based on statistics. So thanks to the previous lecture, you already know the main tools that will be needed, uh, concentration inequalities, and then let's uh, discover together how to use them uh, in adaptive sampling strategy. So just a quick uh, a recap, I guess, for all of them of why do we use this terminology bandits? It comes from the name, an old name for a slot machine in a casino, which was a one-armed bandit. And unlike this octopus, we are actually not able to sample the arms of the bandits and collect the corresponding uh, amount of coins in the casino, but we instead have to uh, wisely choose one arm after in the other, still with the idea to maximize a revenue. Uh, of course, these kind of models were not at all developed to make a researcher rich by winning casinos, because in this example, even the best slot machine in hindsight has a negative uh, expectation. Uh, however, there are uh, a lot of other examples in which bandit algorithm can actually uh, be useful. So maybe it is interesting to know that bandits were studied first in the statistical community from the 1950s. And the archetypical example that the introduction of th those papers would give was that of uh, uh, sequential clinical trials in which the different arms are different treatments and sampling an arm means giving the treatment to a patient and then observing a random outcome on whether or not the treatment was successful on the patient. And so in this context, the idea is to wisely choose the next treatment to give to a patient based on all the prior observation. So sadly, the application of bandits are more in the other part, where it's much easier to have data and millions of users, that of online advertisement, where this time the arms, the option, would be different advertisement, and sampling an arm means showing an ad to someone and observing whether or not it clicks, because clicks are usually related to revenues. And so you should also choose wisely which ad to display based on the past. So this choosing widely is what we will try to, uh, uh, to do. And so we will model what is a sequential strategy first. And so I will formally introduce this uh, multi-armed bandit problem. And after that, I will present you with the uh, more popular solution to it. So we will start with simple variant of what could be called a greedy strategy. And then we will present two important families of algorithm, optimistic algorithm first, and then randomized variants, including some uh, Bayesian uh, approaches. So what is a bandit model? So think about this K slot machine, this K arms, this K uh, actions in the RL terminology. And so we assume that each of these actions is associated to a, a reward stream. So this reward stream is this uh, uh, X80. So X80 represents the reward if I get, if at time T, I, cho I choose to sample arm A. And the cracks in the bandit model is that you cannot observe what you would get with other arm. The bandit information is precisely choose only at each time set one of the arm. And you, you make this choice sequentially. So you choose, I will denote by 80 the arm chosen at time t. And the received reward is the corresponding uh, 
value of the rewards tree. And so the constraint of the strategy of the agent is that the arm chosen at time t plus one can only depend on the past chosen arms and the past observed reward. And the goal is to maximize the sum of rewards the agent gets. So here, I am not very explicit on what these reward streams are, because there is also a, a very interesting literature that consider a totally adversarial setting where those rewards could just be chosen by nature. But to fit with the reinforcement learning uh, paradigm, what we will consider is stochastic bandit, where this reward stream are generated under the simplest possible stochastic process, which is IID. So in this case, the k arm are represented by k probability distribution, which are unknown, of course, to the agent. So I denote by new a the distribution that generates the reward of arm a, and it has some expectation uh, mu a. And so in this context, the reward rt observed upon choosing arm a t is an iid, an independent draw from the distribution associated to that arm. And because of the stochastic na nature of the model, it, is, it actually makes sense also, so this sum of reward will be a random variable that has actually very complex tails. And a common criterion that is looked at in the literature is to try to maximize the expectation of the sum of reward. So this is exactly uh, solving a Markov decision process with a single state, because unlike in RL, where you have this navigation problem, you are always facing the same action in every round. If you did not choose an action today, you will choose it tomorrow. That's not a problem. So there is a single state, unknown mean rewards for all your actions. And your criterion is the expected sum of reward up to an horizon. So it could be, for example, solving a finite horizon or episodic uh, MDP. So in, in bandits, usually, the horizon is not assumed to be known, and the best algorithm do not need to know it to, do the, to make the most uh, of it. So just to go back to uh, the previous example and also uh, talk about the possible assumptions that we make on the reward uh, distribution. So the example of clinical trial, the simplest model for the efficacy of a treatment is just a binary variable. Did the treatment cure the patient or not? So uh, in this, the corresponding bandits consist in considering a set of Bernoulli distribution, and then the response to a treatment is one with the probability, the unknown probability that the, the treatment is curing the, the symptom. And when we seek to maximize expected sum of rewards in this problem, it means that we want to maximize the expected number of patients that we cured during the trial. So actually, in clinical trials, sometimes they consider other performance metrics, such as finding rapidly the best arm, because afterwards, this arm will be given to a larger population. But today, we will stick to the already very interesting reinforcement learning problem associated to Bandit, which is that of maximizing the reward. And in the other case I described, so I talked about uh, online advertisement, but typically in the recommender systems, uh, any recommendation problem could be modeled as a Bandit. So for example, you want to present movies to user, and when you recommend a movie, you ask for a rating that could be, for example, a number between one to, to five. So in that case, the distribution associated to an arm could be a distribution with a finite support. But you could also sometimes uh, show an ad to a user and monitor the amount of money he spends on your website. In that case, you have continuous uh, distribution modeled, for example, as Gaussian with unknown mean and possibly unknown variance. So there are plenty of assumptions you can make on the distribution depending on your application. Those are just a few uh, examples. So how do we define the performance measure? So of course, there is a value we already talked about. But actually, in Bandit, we try to go beyond convergence, which is typically what we can establish sometimes for RL. So we look at a second order uh, notion called regret. So first, let me introduce the a relevant notation. So 
Uh, if you knew in advance the distribution and their means, obviously the best strategy to maximize revenue is to always play the best the action with the largest mean. So I denote this action by A star, and I denote by mu star the largest expected mean in my bandit. And so uh, maximizing reward is equivalent to minimizing a quantity, a very important quantity in all the online learning literature called regret. And the regret measures the difference between the sum of rewards that the oracle strategy playing always the best arm in hindsight gets, so this is t times mu star, minus the expected sum of reward you get with your adaptive strategy, which is agnostic to the means. And so what do we expect for the regret? We expect the regret to be sublinear, because then it means that the average reward we collect with the strategy converges to mu star, which is uh, the, uh, the optimal value. But actually, in, the, in bandit, stochastic bandit, we will be able to be more precise on what is the rate of growth of the regret at the function of t. We will see example of algorithm with square root t regret and even with logarithmic uh, regret. So to control the regret of an algorithm, it is very important to relate this performance measure to a quite intuitive quantity, which is how much time did the algorithm select each of the arm. So ideally, a good algorithm should only select arm A star, but of course it's not possible because at the beginning we don't know, so we have to explore a little bit. And so the regret decomposition writes as a sum over the arm of delta A, which is the suboptimality gap of arm A, so which measure how, how far is the mean of arm A to the best mean mu star, multiplied by the expected number of times that we selected some arm A up to time t. So to prove this, you can uh, check it on the, on the slides. There is here one conditioning saying that the sum of the observation is uh, as the same expectation as the sum of the mean of the chosen distribution. And then when it's written like that, you can put here mu star everywhere, and you get the sum of the gaps. And then just by reordering, clustering this by uh, identity of the arm, here this sum can be rewritten as a sum of the arm of gap of arm A times number of time I selected it. So the details are not very important, but just remember that to control regret, actually what we will prove is bounds on how much time the algorithm is selected the suboptimal arm. And looking at this formula also gives us an idea of the behavior of a good algorithm. If you want a small regret, you should not select too often arms for which delta A is large. But of course, at the beginning, you don't know the gaps, so you have to estimate them. So estimating them need extra exploration. So you will need to, uh, to achieve this uh, well-known exploration, exploitation trade-off. So on the first end of the spectrum, what is exploitation? So we are facing this slot machine. We know we want to maximize our revenue. It's quite natural to just uh, summarize the performance of the slot machine by uh, what was the average revenue we got before. So to estimate their quality with uh, the, uh, the empirical means, so which is just the average of the reward we got in the past when sampling this, uh, this machine. So of course, this greedy strategy has to first select each of the arm once, otherwise you cannot estimate anything. But after doing that, you pick the arm that has the largest empirical mean in every round. So this is really greedy. Uh, but it's quite easy on a simple Bernoulli bandit model with two arms to understand why this strategy can fail. Because just because of randomness, assume that arm one is better than arm two, the first time you play arm one, it gives you a zero, which happens with probability one minus mu one. And you are also lucky for the suboptimal arm that gives you a one, which happens with probability mu two. And then when this happens, the uh, empirical mean of arm one will be equal to zero. And so it will always be strictly smaller than the empirical mean of arm two, meaning that the greedy strategy is always going to choose the suboptimal arm. So it's the number of selection 
of arm two is lower bounded by uh, t minus one times the probability to be uh, unlucky on the good arm and uh, lucky on the bad arm. And so therefore, the regret will also be linear, and we will not even have convergence of the algorithm to a, a good average reward. So this means that pure exploration is not enough, and so the, uh, the interest of bandit algorithm is to add the right amount of uh, exploration. So to do that, we will start with simple strategies that just try to fix a little bit uh, what is happening with uh, greedy. Also, before I start this, I forgot to ask, but feel free to interrupt me at any time if you uh, have a question or need a, a clarification. So what was wrong with greedy? What was wrong is that we just initialized our estimates with just one sample, and then we could have this lucky-unlucky phenomenon that explains the linear regret. But this might not happen if we take a little bit more of exploration at the beginning. So the idea of explore then commit, or sometimes explore then exploit, is to do a, a well-chosen length of exploration. So we, you pick a parameter m and we draw each arm m times, after which we compute the empirical best arm based on m sample per arm, and then we, then we need to exploit a bit. We, we stick to uh, playing this arm until the end of our budget. So let's try to analyze this algorithm. Again, in a simple situation with two arms, where mu1 is larger than mu2, so the regret of the algorithm, according to the formula I just showed you, is equal to the gap between the mean multiplied by the expected number of time we select the bad arm. But under this strategy, it's quite explicit the number of time we selected arm two. We select it m times during the exploration phase, and then if this arm was elected to be the best empirically, then we play it an additional t minus 2 m times, meaning that then the regret will be upbounded by, upper bounded by delta m plus delta t, I'm ignoring this, multiplied by the probability to pick the wrong arm. But what is the probability to pick the wrong arm? It's precisely the probability that the empirical mean of arm 2 based on m samples was larger than the empirical mean of arm 1 based on M samples. And this is actually unlikely to happen due to concentration inequalities. Indeed, we want to do, as I emphasized at the beginning, non-asymptotic analysis, and actually we can uh, bound this. And uh, so when we want to use the concentration inequality, as the talk of Yevgeny uh, highlighted, then we have to make some assumption on our distribution. And for example, if we are willing to assume that the distribution are bounded in zero one, then we can use Öfding inequality to control this. So why uh, can we use Öfding? Here, we want to control the probability that an empirical mean is larger than another. So you can rewrite everything. Sorry, I, I wanted to write on my slides, but I found out it was not possible. So you just put this guy here, and this difference of empirical mean is also the empirical mean of the sum of the differences, and then you can apply uh, a concentration inequality because uh, the expectation here is supposed uh, to be um, to be equal to minus delta, and so it's not very likely that uh, you get a positive value, and precisely you you end up by exceeding by the gap, uh, the, the means. Okay. It was not very clear, but you can easily uh, do the computation yourself on a piece of paper uh, to understand that with Hufding inequality, here you will get an exponentially decaying uh, probability of these two happens and scaling with uh, delta square, the gap between the two means. So now that we have bounded the regret, we see here, of course, a dependency in the parameter m. So the natural question is, what is the best value of m? So again, you can do the math yourself or trust me. If we wisely pick m to be roughly log of t delta square divided by delta square, we end up with this form of regret. So we got really a sublinear regret, which is a logarithmic scaling with 1 over delta time uh, log t. So it makes sense because 
so when delta is small, it means that the, somehow the two arms are harder to discriminate, and so it makes sense to have a, a slightly, uh, it could make sense to have a slightly larger regret. So this is nice. However, the big limitation here is that the choice of M needed to know first the horizon, which is sometimes viewed as a problem, sometimes not. Maybe in a clinical trial, you know how many patients you have. In contextual advertisement, you don't know how many people will visit your websites. But the biggest problem in both cases is you never know what is the difference, the true difference or lower bound on it uh, between your arms. So this is, this is a limitation that we can somehow overcome by changing a little bit the length of the exploration phase to also be adaptive. So instead of choosing in advance how many pools I will dedicate to exploration, you actually stop exploring, so you sample the two arms in a round-robin fashion, until their difference in empirical mean is significant, where here significant is some comparison to a threshold that does not depend on uh, delta. And when exploration ends, then you also commit to the arm that was the largest uh, among the two. So you here it's an illustration of uh, the process uh, uh, of the difference of empirical mean, and when it hits this boundary, then you stop, and in that case, the difference is positive, so we would pick commit to mu1. So this strategy was uh, uh, analyzed in the particular case of Gaussian uh, bandits, and was proved also to attain logarithmic regret without the knowledge of delta. But there is also an interesting result in those papers saying that even if the regret is logarithmic, it's a regret that will be always worse than the best strategy that we can get with, for example, UCB, uh, as I will show you. So we know for two arms and Gaussian that even this smartly stopping the exploration leads to not optimal uh, regret. Another possible fix of greedy, um, which is on the randomized side, is something you've already seen a lot in the, the class in the previous week and actually come from RL. It's this idea of doing just epsilon greedy. So meaning at round t, with some probability epsilon, you pick an arm uniformly at random to make sure to explore enough. And otherwise, then you, you are greedy because you know that you will always, you will never be stuck because you have only one sample. You, because of the exploration, uh, it will fix things. Actually, it's easy to convince yourself that with a constant epsilon, you have a constant probability to pick all the suboptimal arm, and therefore you will also have a constant, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a linear regret. <coughs> Where here, d mean is the smallest gap in the, um, in the bandit problem. So if a possible fix is to consider a decaying, is it better like this? I'm sorry for the weird sound that the mic is making. So if you consider a decaying epsilon, a decay specifically in some parameter divided by t, uh, then actually you can get logarithmic regret for greedy. However, here, note that you need to select the parameter of the decay with a prior knowledge, again, on the minimal gap between the best arm and the second best arm. And again, this is not something you know in practice. So when people use uh, epsilon greedy in industries, they do some heavy hyperparameter tuning to find what is a good epsilon for uh, my type of data, and then they use it and it can work, but it's not a satisfying solution that would adapt to any uh, bandit. Yes? Uh, here I'm considering a fixed set of arm. But yes, yeah, there could be some bandit setting where you allow some arm to enter or leave the system. This has been studied in the literature, but so far K is assumed to be known but not this, uh, this parameter D. Are there other questions? Before we move to... Uh, well, I guess if D is too large, you can get linear regrets. Maybe they proved it in the paper of our, I'm not sure, but yeah, for sure, uh, it will not work on any problem. Okay, so ready for some optimism. So I really like this uh, optimistic uh, principle uh, in general, but for statisticians, what is optimism? 
it's the, the main idea in Bandit is not to rely only on the information given by point estimates by empirical means. And a way to do that is to uh, balance for the uncertainty which is captured, for example, in a confidence interval that we can build on uh, each of the unknown means that are our parameter of uh, interest. So this confidence of interval, interval sorry, takes the form of a lower confidence bound and an upper confidence bound. So here they are depicted on a four-arm bandit problems where the true means are here the red diamonds. And we see that some confidence intervals are larger than others. So large confidence interval has a large uncertainty and is typically associated to arms that have been sampled not too much. Whereas small confidence interval are for arms for which we, we gathered more samples. So somehow they also convey the information of how much certain we are about the, the estimates. And the idea of the optimistic principle is to say this confidence interval represents the possible bandit models. Let's pretend we are in the best possible bandits, the best possible casino in which the mean payoff of each machine would be the largest possible mean payoff. So this is the bandit model that you probably don't see in, uh, in, uh, in yellow here. And if this were the truth, then you would just select the arm with largest mean. So in that case, with largest upper bound on the confidence interval. So this defines actually a family of algorithm, because as long as you can build this upper and lower confidence bond, well, in that case, you just need the upper confidence bond, uh, you can propose an algorithm. And Yevgeny showed you in this class many ways to have concentration inequalities that will in turn give you a confidence interval. So depending on what you know in your distribution, you might want to use this sophisticated empirical Bernstein if you know that uh, your distribution have, are bounded from above and you control variances. But uh, here I will present just the simplest possible UCB based on uh, Öfding inequality for bounded or sub-Gaussian random variables, which popularized somehow the uh, UCB algorithm. <coughs> so what do we need for a confidence interval? So for this, you will have to trust me. For the analysis to work, and you will see shortly why, we need a guarantee of the kind, the probability that the UCB is above the true means, so that it is indeed an upper confidence bound, needs to be of order 1 minus 1 over t. And here you notice that when t go, uh, increases, we increase the coverage we demand for our confidence interval, which will create also some exploration uh, mechanisms. And so to design this confidence interval, yes? It's roughly, basically you need the series of the 1 over t to converge, uh, to be smaller than uh, log t. So 1 over t log t will do the job. Usually people do 1 over t square, but in spirit it's 1 over t. Uh, okay, so let's use a standard assumption that I liked a lot. Is this sigma sub Gaussian assumption that Yevgeny talked about. It's nice because it, sim it simultaneously covered two use cases. Gaussian with uh, variance sigma, which could be useful in practice for continuous rewards. And also, uh, an assumption very common also in RL is this reward bounded in zero one, because uh, bounded distributions are a particular example of sigma sub Gaussian distribution with sigma equal uh, one fourth. So, this is a way to uh, make UCB work for two uh, different family of uh, rewards. So this is recap of Öfding inequality in the um, sub Gaussian case. Yes. Yeah, uh, I wanted to know what is the motivation behind uh, oops, using uh, optimism, like uh, the confidence, uh, upper confidence. Is it just because you can use uh, concentration inequality to bound, so you have uh, access to this value or is there another motivation or intuition behind why is it good to use optimism? Actually, I will show you a proof of a, a quick analysis of UCB. Basically, uh, when uh, arms are inside the confidence interval, you can easily relate the number of selection to the size of the confidence interval and to the gaps. And it really works because of the optimism, as you will see in the proof. But mm. how people got the idea that being optimistic is good, 
I actually don't know. Okay. But maybe you will develop your own uh, philosophy about that uh, very soon. Thank you. So, uh, okay, so we have everything in equality. As Yevgeny already told you, the, the difficulty is that you cannot apply this concentration inequality when the number of observation is uh, random because it creates some weird dependency and then you have all these counter example uh, E created. So we have to be very careful in the bandit algorithm and actually I just reviewed a paper who was again applying everything inequality with a random number <laughs> of observation. So don't do that if you ever want to do a paper on bandit or don't ask me to be a reviewer. Um, so let's just uh, see in the, on this example again the, the union bound. So here what we want to prove is that this, which will be our candidate UCB, uh, is larger than mu a with probability 1 minus, I chose the simple 1 over t squared. Uh, here the difficulty is that NAT is random. And what we know how to control is the empirical mean of uh, a, number, a fixed number s of observation. So we say that the empirical mean used at time t of the algorithm is the empirical mean based on the NAT first observation, but NAT is random variable. And how do we cope with it? Just by saying, okay, to, to prove this, we need to upper bound the probability of the complementary of this event. And here, to handle the random NA, we just say, okay, well, we know that NAT cannot be larger than T, so the fact that this holds implies that there exists a value of S such that uh, we have the corresponding inequality for the empirical mean of EPS observation. And then we upper bound the probability of the union by the sum of probability. This is a union bound. And then we use a thing, then it's fine, and we get the 1 over t square. So just uh, think of union bound. There are more sophisticated stuff than union bound, but we will not enter in this uh, uh, nice martingale details for, for today. So as I showed you, a possible UCB based on Oeding takes the following form, empirical mean, plus some, something that we call sometimes the exploration bonus of the form square root of uh, uh, some parameter alpha log t divided by the number of draws. And we see here that um, the, the log t here comes from the 1 over t square we wanted for the coverage probability. And actually, when you don't draw an arm for a while, it's mu, mu hat and its n remains frozen. However, it's the log t augments, meaning that this arm will eventually be, uh, uh, be selected. So this form of UCB could be tra traced back to some old work, but was really popularized with this UCB1 algorithm of uh, Auer et al. in 2002, uh, considering bounded reward, so which is a special case with uh, uh, the sigma before uh, equal to, to 1, 4. And the analysis was uh, later refined in a subsequent work. So before digging in the analysis and understanding on the theoretical level why UCB can work, let's see how it works in, uh, in practice. So here you have a little video on uh, showing how the uh, UCBs evolve with time in a five-arm uh, bandit. And on the x-axis, you see how much time the arm were drawn. So at the beginning, you have very wide confidence intervals for every arm. And then you see that one arm starts to be drawn more and start to have a very concentrated confidence interval, whereas the, the other remain, uh, remain uh, wider. And so this algorithm tends actually to align the upper confidence bound on all arms, meaning that at the end, the good ones will have very small confidence interval and the ba bad ones larger. And here you really have the behavior expected. The best arm is the third one here, and you see you, you really draw it uh, an overwhelming fraction of, uh, of time. So indeed, UCB will also have the same kind of uh, logarithmic regrets that we, uh, uh, we, we were managed to prove for explore and commit when we choose the exploration uh, length uh, wisely. 
And the consequence of a bound of the number of arms because of the formula of the regret is that the regret will also be logarithmic. And here we have what we call a problem dependent quantity, a sum of the arms of one over the inverse gaps. So again, the more arms are closer to uh, the best, the larger will be the constant in front of the log. So this constant somehow reflects the difficulty of your uh, bounded problem. So how do we analyze UCB? So we will leverage this upper and lower confidence bound in the proof. So this proof is basically the proof of uh, our uh, simplify a little bit. And so the good event, what happened with high probability is that the best arm is not underestimated, so it is indeed below its UCB, and the bad arm is not overestimated, so it is indeed above its lower confidence bound. And just with Ufding inequality, we can upper bound the probability of the bad event, of the complementary of this, by these two sums that we managed to upper bound on the previous slides by two over t squared. And so to understand why UCB works, you have to understand this argument. What happened on the good event? On the good event, you know that mu1 is smaller than its UCB in red. Mu a, which is the suboptimal arm we want to control the number of pools in this proof, is upper bounding by its lower confidence bound. And you also know, and you, you are looking at what happens when the algorithm selects arm a. So we know that mu a is larger than LCB. We also know that mu1 is larger than mu a, because 1 is my notation for the optimal arm. Maybe it was not obvious, sorry. Uh, you know that mu1 is uh, larger, smaller than its UCB. And because the algorithm chose arm a, you know that the UCB of a is larger than the UCB of mu1. So all this together tells you that the confidence interval of arm a has to contain both mu1 and mu a. And in particular, it means that the gap between the two has to be smaller than the width of the confidence interval, which is 2 times the square root of this uh, log t over n. And if you invert the inequality, it tells you that the arm a cannot be drawn too much. It tells you that n a t is indeed upper bounded by log t divided by gap squared. And this is why there is a gap square in the, uh, in the proof. So indeed, putting things together, if we want to control the expected number of selection of A, we want to control the sum of the probabilities that we selected arm A, and we intersect with the good event or its complementary. And here we get something that sums to a constant. And here we get the sum of the probabilities that we selected arm A while the number, total number of selection was smaller than this. So it's not hard to convince you that in total this cannot be larger than this because of the constraint uh, that we have here. So this gives us the nice uh, uh, upper bound that uh, I have, I gave you before, which leads to what is called a problem dependent bound on the regret. So limitation is that the constant in front of the log could really blow up, as I said several times, when the means get closer. Whereas actually when you have, for example, two arms where the two are very good, it should be fine to actually select arm two a lot. And so this phenomenon is captured by what is called worst case bounds, and that you will see to tomorrow in the class in contextual bandits on RL. So a worst case bound is telling you that, okay, the regret in any problem is never worse than something of the form uh, square root uh, kt log t. So here we have a bound that does not depend on the specific means of the problem. So that's why it's called sometimes problem independent or uh, worst case. So I, I will just skip the proof uh, in the interest of, of time. But the idea is that each time you have a guarantee like that, when you write the regret, you just distinguish between arms that are very close to the optimal arm, for which it's more interesting to bound their regret by delta t, and arms that have a larger gap, for which it's more interesting to use the problem-dependent bounds, and then by carefully choosing the threshold between uh, uh, interesting and non-interesting arms and doing some math, you end up with this uh, minimax bounds. 
Um, to wrap up on bounds, uh, the one I showed you on the slides, the proof I made is an easy proof, but actually it has been refined a bit with better concentration inequality and some nice trick in the literature. So just for completeness, I, st I state the best available uh, of the shelf bounds. It's interesting because actually it allows to use a tighter UCB, which has practical consequences when you apply this algorithm. So if you have sub-Gaussian rewards, you could select the UCB to be um, mu hat plus square root of two sigma log t divided by NAT. And this is the best constant that you can get in front of the log with this algorithm. So for the algorithm that I called UCB alpha for sigma sub-Gaussian rewards, uh, what's, what it proves is that if we set the parameter alpha to be uh, two sigma square, so alpha was governing the size of the confidence bonus, we get a worst case bound of square root kt log t and a problem dependent bound scaling with this quantity. And now is the time to uh, answer the question whether those are good regret. Yes, Tor? Uh, it could be, yes. I probably uh, skipped it. Yeah, it still depends on the variance, but not the means. So it depends on the distribution, but much lighter. You're right. OK, so here, is it under the square root, maybe? Yes, sigma squared under the, the square root. OK, so are these bounds good? So let's first talk about the minimax bound. Actually, there is a result in the literature saying that uh, for every bounded algorithm, you can find a crazily hard instance on which your regret has to be larger than square root kt, meaning that a square root kt log t bound is kind of good. So there are better algorithms that even shave off the log t, but they are a bit more complex to present. And it is interesting to look at what is the hard bounded instance in this bound. It's basically a Bernoulli bounded where all the means are one half except one which is larger by a tiny margin of square root 1 over t. So those are not the typical bounded problem you encounter in practice. This is why when the gap is large, you also want to know what is the best problem-dependent regret uh, that you can get. And this is given also by a lower bound that exists in the statistics literature since the 1980s, given by Lai and Robbins. So the original bound applied to simple parametric models, such that uh, all the means are Bernoulli or all the means are Gaussian. That are the two things you can cover under the sub-Gaussian uh, framework if you're interested. Uh, and actually, the bound do not feature gaps, but it features the kullback leibler divergence between the distributions. So typically, if we are looking at Gaussian bandits, the scale divergence will be equal to the squared gap uh, between the means divided by two times the variance. Uh, whereas for Bernoulli bandit, it will be this more complex binary KL divergence that Yevgeny showed you before. And the results say that, uh, so it's an asymptotic lower bound saying that when t is large, the expected number of time we need to select a suboptimal arm is log t divided by here, the KL between the distribution with mean mu a and the distribution with mean mu star. And so, how are we doing with respect to the lower bound? If we take Gaussian bandits, uh, the, the lower bound becomes uh, two sigma square divided by gap square, log t. And actually, this is precisely the upper bound we got when applying UCB with the parameter alpha equal two sigma square. So UCB is already asymptotically optimal. So UCB based on Öfding is asymptotically optimal for Gaussian. However, for Bernoulli, there is a slight mismatch between the lower bound and the upper bound, given by the fact that here we got something with gaps, whereas here we get something with KL. And to close the gap, you actually have to use more sophisticated confidence intervals based on this KL inequality that uh, Yevgeny showed you. So uh, here it's an inequality that can be proved for any simple parametric distribution. Uh, like an exponential family, for example, where you have to take the KL to be the KL divergence in this family. For
For example, if you apply it to Bernoulli, you use binary KL di divergence. If you apply it to Gaussian, you use the Gaussian uh, divergence. And so the, the shape of the confidence interval is a bit uh, less explicit. But um, basically, you can compute the KL function. So here, in blue, you have KL mu hat Q as a function of Q. And you are thresholding it up to some level log t divided by nat. And then you get your UCB. So this requires to solve a simple optimization problem. It's not a big, uh, a big overhead, but still it's less explicit than this mu hat plus square root of 1 over n. Um, and so what was proved is that when applying this algorithm called KL UCB, so maximizing this more complex UCB, we can actually exactly match the lion robbins lower bound. So this was proved in 2013 by, uh, by Capé, uh, Capé et al. So this gives us uh, an asymptotically optimal algorithm in a problem-dependent uh, sense. And the last algorithm close to this family I wanted to mention before talking about a bit about this uh, randomized algorithm is a nice algorithm called uh, IMED, which is actually slightly different than uh, UCB. And in particular, it has a nice property not to feature any confidence interval tuned with con concentration inequalities. Here in uh, UCB or KLUCB, there was always this log T that came from the fact that we needed to construct an upper confidence bound that is valid with high probability. And actually, those constructions are based on mass and are often not very tight. If you measure through empirical simulation what is the actual coverage, you get something usually much bigger than what you ask for with concentration inequality. So this is why it's nice to have algorithms that do not depend on any tuning of confidence regions. And so IMED has this property. So it is a... It was originally proposed for bounded distribution, but it can be used under the same assumptions than KLUCB, for example, Bernoulli, Gaussian, or exponential family. It also requires to know the KL function that appears in the lower bound for the corresponding uh, family. And so what the algorithm does is that it computes out of all the arm the largest empirical mean uh, that was found, and then it, it selects the arm that minimizes uh, the, di the distance between uh, mu at A and this proxy for mu star, which we don't know, multiplied by the number of uh, selection. And to work, we need this regularization, this additional uh, log NAT, uh, to make sure that all the arm will be uh, eventually uh, eventually drawn uh, sufficiently, because if an arm is not drawn, this guy does not change whether the other evolve, and so this is the mechanism that makes us select all the arm uh, sufficiently many. And so IMED is not, strictly speaking, what we called an index policy in bandits, because an index policy is something like UCB, which computes for each arm something that depends only on the reward you got from that arm. But here, the index, if you will, computed for arm A, also depends on mu star hat, meaning it also depends on what we observed on other arms. So it's a slightly different family of algorithm, and it's a slightly different kind of uh, analysis, which uh, I will not enter into, uh, into details. But I recently came across the fact that in practice, as you will show in, you see in the uh, in a few slides, this is usually a bit better than the KLUCB uh, counterpart. So it was some advertisement for IMED. Okay. Uh, so this was still kind of using uh, uncertainty contained in confidence interval, which is uh, something that in statistics is uh, usually associated to the frequentist uh, world that Yevgeny talked about. And now I want to make a little uh, uh, detour in the Bayesian words, because it's kind of an interesting story in the bandit literature. I, I told you that the bandit paper were in statistics in uh, the 1950s, but actually 
The very first bandit algorithm can be traced to a paper in 1933 by Thompson. Uh, and the proposed algorithm suggested by this paper is now called the Thompson sampling and used quite a lot in practice. And the way it does exper uh, exploration is uh, quite different from uh, UCB. That's why I put it in this category of uh, algorithm who do exploration with randomization. So how does this Thomson sampling algorithm actually randomize? So it comes from a Bayesian paradigm, meaning that the uncertainty is not summarized by this uh, confidence interval, but rather by distributions. So in a Bayesian framework, you assume some uh, prior, meaning that the unknown parameter here in red, you say, OK, each one is, for example, drawn from a uniform distribution over zero run, because I know I am facing Bernoulli's. I don't know where my mean lies. I encode this by, this is, it is sample from some uniform distribution. Uh, and then assuming that the mu's are random variable, what Bayesian compute is the posterior distribution. Uh, the posterior distribution of arm A is the conditional distribution of your random variable mu A given the observation you've made. And here, in a particular example of uh, Bernoulli bandits, I presented the, uh, the standard easy to manipulate posteriors that are used, which are beta dist uh, distributions. We will come back to it later. And so here you have to move a bit your head, but here you have the density of the distribution of each arm. And you have a bit the same phenomenon than with the drawings with confidence interval. Uh, there are some arms that have very peaky uh, posterior distribution, so for which you have sampled them a lot, and so your posterior has become super concentrated. Whereas there are some arms, here I got four samples from this guy, I still have a very wide uh, posterior. So what is Thompson sampling doing with its posterior? The way it was written in the 1933 paper is, okay, let's randomize the arm and compute the probability to select a given arm in this randomization to be the posterior probability that this arm is better. Meaning concretely, you have this beta distribution, you want to compute the probability that this distribution gives you a sample larger than the sample of all other distribution. So even in our time, this is a hard to perform uh, computation. And in 1933, it was even worse, even for two, uh, for two arm. And actually, to realize this, to draw a sample from uh, this um, uh, randomization that Thompson suggested, actually, you can convince yourself that it is equivalent to actually just draw one sample from each of the posterior distribution and select the arm that gave you the largest sample. Because the probability that you select a given arm is precisely the probability that theta A was larger than all the others. So it's precisely the posterior probability that this arm was optimal. And so uh, nowadays, how Thompson sampling is presented is, OK, your posterior is encoding some also uh, like it could generate you possible worlds, possible NDPs, possible bandits. You just sample a possible model in your problem, a possible bandit, and you pretend this is the truth, and therefore you just choose the one that has the largest uh, samples. So here is, a, here, uh, is an illustration again for Bernoulli distribution, for which I told you that a natural prior is a uniform prior, so that the posterior belong to this family of beta distribution, which has a bit twisted Gaussians. Well, sometimes they can really look a bit like exponentials, but in some uh, uh, border cases. But a beta distribution is a well-known tabulated in all your uh, software uh, distribution that has two parameters. And in that case, the first parameter is the SAT is the number of success, the sum of reward we got from arm A. And here, Na minus Sa is the number of zero we have. So when uh, to maintain this posterior, it's really computationally efficient because we sample an arm, we observe whether we got a zero or a one. 
if we get a zero, we update the second parameter. If we get a one, we update the first parameter. So it's something really easy to, uh, to store. And so what Thompson sampling is doing is, for each arm, it draws a sample from the corresponding posterior distribution, and then it selects the arm that gave the largest sample. And so if you want to implement this with Gaussian distributions, so Bernoulli and Gaussian were my two uh, examples, then you change the, pro uh, the prior you put, and you can choose it in such a way, so this is not actually a distribution, but it's what is called an improper posterior in uh, Bayesian statistics, still you get your posterior to be a Gaussian distribution with mean uh, mu at 80, so the empirical mean, and with variance sigma square and 80. So this means that Thompson sampling could be also viewed as another fix of the greedy strategy, that instead of using as an index for each arm the empirical mean, it is adding a bit of noise to it. Sometimes it will lower the mean or uh, putting it uh, higher. So it's another way to, uh, uh, to randomize. And so randomization is, is what achieves exploration there because here in these two arm scenarios, in that case I drew a sample theta one for the arm in red, a sample theta two for the arm in blue. And in that case, the fact that theta one is larger than theta two tells me to pick arm one. But sometimes, because of randomness, we, we will get a sample of blue in its right tail, whereas we will get a sample, of, a sample of red in its left tail, and we will still keep exploring just the right amount of time the, the other arm. So on the theoretical level, what's, what is known for Thompson sampling, despite the fact that the algorithm is Bayesian, the guarantees that we have are frequentist. So what do I mean by frequentist guarantees? Is that this is the same kind of guarantees than we have for UCB. We use this prior and posterior in the algorithm, but then we can prove that for any choice of uh, means in a given parametric distribution, for example, Bernoulli's, we can control the number of selection of all the sub suboptimal arm when this is the true, uh, the true bandits. And we get the exactly the bond with, uh, with KL. So thi this was first proof for the Bernoulli bandit with uniform prior that I uh, used in the introduction. It is also known for uh, one-dimensional exponential families. So it means that with the corresponding KL function, so we're really matching this uh, lower bound we, we proved for, uh, for Thompson sampling. But beyond one parameter models, so Claire will talk tomorrow about Thompson sampling in these more complex contextual bandits, it's usually harder and you have to choose your prior uh, carefully and even, so in this paper by Yonda and Takemura, they, they consider the case of Gaussian distribution, but where you also don't know the variance. In that case, you can also do a terms like a put a prior on both the mean and the variance, sample it. But in that case, it doesn't work for any choice of, uh, uh, of prior. So this is an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon. Okay, so I, I told you I would uh, show you a bit the practical performance because this has been uh, a lot about theory so far. So if we recap the different algorithm I showed you, so we had these optimistic families. So here I'm performing uh, an experiment on Bernoulli arms. So here uh, there are 10 arms. I chose, uh, so this is a scenario that comes from the KLUCB paper, I think, that is supposed to represent what happens in online advertisement, where typically the click probability are quite small. And so when you have 10 arms with quite small means, this is where you will get the largest difference between an algorithm that adapts to the geometry of Bernoulli random variables and an algorithm that just uses a simple sub-Gaussian assumption. So UCB is a simple UCB with explicit form based on Öfding. KL UCB is this more complex confidence interval based on the uh, KL inequality. IMED is a hybrid algorithm that uh, uh, uses the computation of the best 
arm in the bandit and co compute some uh, divergence. Here, what is IMED SG is IMED algorithm where instead of the Bernoulli KL, I use the sub Gaussian, uh, the sub -Gaussian uh, KL. So IMED SG is supposed to be close to UCB, and uh, IMED is supposed to be close to KL UCB. And here we get uh, Thomson sampling. And so uh, what I uh, I run this uh, little experiment that you might run uh, tomorrow in the uh, practical session or something very similar. And so this is a regret as a function of time estimated over, uh, I don't remember how many, uh, at least a thousand of, uh, um, of repetition of independent runs because the regret is an expectation. So to estimate it, you have to, uh, to use a Monte Carlo uh, estimation. And here we see that so smaller is better because it's it's regret. All the curves have kind of logarithmic profile or square root t. It's hard to to distinguish, but we see that here uh, IMED and Thomson sampling are the best among all these algorithm. And we particularly note the gap between UCB and KL UCB and uh, IMED. Sorry. And uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, because yeah, UCB is not supposed to be optimal for this particular distribution. And this is just showing you that, OK, it's also, it's also res reflected in, uh, in practical uh, experiments. And th the two most performant algorithms, I just want you to observe that those are the only ones that are not depending on a tuning made with a uh, confidence interval, this IMED and, uh, and Thomson sampling. Thomson sampling, it's also just sampling a posterior. It is not choosing some quantile of it or something like that. So, uh, so yeah, that's what I wanted you to remember for the practical story. So I don't know how much time I have left, like 15 minutes, maybe? OK, well. That, but then people will be tired. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, the last part of the talk is something a bit more recent that uh, uh, I worked on with some uh, with some students is trying to uh, have something that would work for, for example, different uh, parametric uh, families. Because if you think about those algorithms, I, no I noticed here the gap between UCB and KLUCB. Uh, so KL UCB, this algorithm will be optimal for Bernoulli. But if you use it for Gaussian, you first you will not be able to compute the KL. This will be a first problem. But I just mean that we you need some prior knowledge on the distribution you're facing to get such good performance. In Bernoulli, this is usually considered OK because you usually know when your da data is going to be binary. But when you go to more complex assumption, like assuming sub Gaussian with a sigma, does it make sense? When it's bounded, do, do we really uh, know the, the bounds? So somehow, we would ideally, we would want a single algorithm that would be optimal on any class of rewards you instantiate it, even without knowing it. And so this reflection uh, made me look a bit uh, in the recent year into these uh, non-parametric approaches. And I will try to uh, present you uh, one or two uh, algorithms I liked from this, uh, from this uh, family. So uh, as I said, the Thomson sampling relies usually on the parametric uh, assumption. So meaning that if you use Thomson sampling for Gaussian, it is not the same algorithm because it is going to draw sample from a Gaussian posterior than Thomson sampling for Bernoulli that is going to draw samples from a beta posterior, or for other exponential family, you will also get different family of, uh, of posterior. And so the idea to extend Thomson sampling to more complex, possibly non-parametric families of uh, distribution would be to replace this idea of sampling a posterior by finding another randomization mechanism that is just using the information that you have, which is OK, those are the rewards I collected. Maybe they are sample from Gaussians. Maybe they are sample from Exponential. Maybe they are sample from Evitail. But I don't know. I just know that I had these rewards. Uh, and so for this, 
A natural idea is to use what is called in st statistics the non-parametric bootstrap. Uh, so you have your history, and you do not want to uh, r summarize it just with the uh, empirical mean, because by now you have understood that uh, just estimators are not reliable, that we should uh, incorporate some uh, exploration. And so uh, to do that, the idea is to change a bit the sample we got by drawing at random with replacements and sample from this batch. Uh, so, so, so n is n80, the number of rewards you have observed for arm A. So we you will pick a first one in the history, replace it, pick another one. So some, some rewards will appear twice, some will never appear, but this allows to propose a noisy samples. And so from this noisy samples, this uh, modified history, then you compute the empirical mean on this, what is called this bootstrap sample. And so this empirical mean of the bootstrap sample is what defines your index. And then you just choose the arm with largest index. So this is the, somehow, for statisticians, the most natural non-parametric variant of, uh, of Thompson sampling, which doesn't, could be applied to any, uh, to any distribution. But actually, what was proved again in this nasty uh, uh, case of uh, two Bernoulli arm is that if you do that, you can get linear regret. And the reason is, again, uh, if for the best arm you are unlucky at the beginning, you will be stuck for a really long time with a, a history of a single reward zero, because you will need for uh, the bootstrap sample of other arm to only contain zeros. And I think in, in this proof, they prove that it has a linear regret if you choose a tie-breaking rule which always breaks ties in favor of the best arm. I don't know if you add randomness, but I think you would still take a very long time to recover from initial bad histories for the best arm. Uh, so a possible fix of this is what is called a perturbed history exploration is to introduce some extra exploration by adding fake rewards inside the history that, we skew, that will skew a bit your history to, to our being more uniform. So if you know that your rewards are in zero run, you will actually, if you have uh, N80 samples in your history, you will add A times N80 fake rewards that are generated completely at random. And so then you do the bootstrapping based on this uh, fake uh, uh, history. And so, yes? Yeah, this is a very bad notation from myself. Let's call this A alpha. So it's a hyperparameter of, uh, of the algorithm. Thank you for the, for the catch. And so for alpha, sorry, uh, strictly larger than two, they managed to prove that they got logarithmic regret, uh, um, uh, expressed with the gaps, so indecent practical performance. But again, here I have this little uh, twist toward always wondering if a method is optimal. And indeed, you can ask, okay, is this the best we can do if we know that the distribution are bounded? So, so far, I did not talk about what is a good lower bound for a complex non-parametric class of uh, bounded rewards, but you will see it's not in this slide, too bad, on the next one. But uh, statisticians have proposed also an optimal algorithm for uh, bounded rewards. And so the, this algorithm that I'm talking here about was called a non-parametric Thomson sampling by uh, uh, its uh, inventors, uh, Ryu and Honda in 2020. So it's an algorithm aimed for a reward bounded in a known range, uh, 0b. And the idea is uh, instead of adding sample and uh, doing resampling, we will just re-rate all the sample completely at random. But interestingly, for this to work, in order to avoid the problem of being stuck with an history that is bad at the beginning, it's very important to add a possibility that the largest reward you could get is inside your history. So you are going to re-rate at random what I call an augmented history. So if you have at time t for arm A uh, this NAT reward you collected, you pretend that you also collected one more reward which was equal to B. 
And then you rewrite them at random, meaning concretely you, you, you draw uh, a random probability distribution supported on uh, N80 plus one points. So this is called the Dirichlet 1111 uh, with N plus one ones distributions. And actually it gets uh, a bit nasty to sample from when N gets large. So this is a, a computational bottleneck of these methods. And then you compute the uh, empirical means, but not with weight one over N for each sample, but with, with weight given by what was drawn in your probability vector. So this is a, a pretty nice uh, idea in my view. And you can also give it even a more general interpretation of using uh, empirical distribution. So an empirical means in this non-parametric setting, you can view it as the expectation of the empirical distribution of reward you got. When you do that, you are actually producing a noisy variant of the empirical distribution that changing the usual one over n weights with these w's, and then you compute the mean of this modified perturbed CDF somehow. Instead of perturbing parameter, as we did when sampling from beta posterior, here we propose perturbation of the empirical CDFs. And when doing that, it allows you to generalize this ID to something that has been looked at in Bandit and also RL recently, is to consider a performance measure which is not the mean. For example, in, if you are interested in some risk-averse criterion, like you evaluate an arm by a trade-off between mean and variance, or by conditional value at risk, if you do that, you can actually just say, okay, I will perturb my CDF and just compute whatever risk measure I'm interested in for the perturbed CDF. So this is a parenthesis of some work we did on Sivar uh, Bandit with a student named Dorian Baudry, which is not on the slides, but I felt like I had some time. But okay, let's go back to a standard uh, non-parametric Thomson sampling for uh, minimizing uh, some of expected rewards uh, in a bandit in which uh, we know that the rewards are bounded. So what is proved by uh, Honda and Ryu for the NPTS is that its regret is logarithmic, scaling again as a sum over the arm of here some quantity. And the quantity here generalizes this notion of KL that we add in the simple parametric model. So this k in the is the smallest value of uh, KL between uh, new and new prime where new prime is a distribution with bounded support whose mean is larger than, uh, than uh, mu. So it, this for exponential family, for Bernoulli, for Gaussian, it exactly boils down to a KL, but for bounded distribution, it, it's more tricky to compute. And it can be proved that this is, there is also a lower bound showing that this is a minimal number of samples we have in a problem dependent sense in this non parametric class of uh, uh, bounded bandits. Okay, so those are uh, other uh, ideas of uh, uh, non parametric algorithms that my student Dorian uh, worked a bit on. So, um, a limitation of NPTS, well, it's not a limitation, it is made to address bounded distributions, but then you can always think. Can I get faster? I have it for a, a universal algorithm for a bounded distribution for any value of the bound. So there are papers that say that this is not possible to get logarithmic regret for bounded distribution, but with unknown range. But you could get maybe log square regret or something. And so uh, Dorian investigated this by changing a bit NPTS by replacing the unknown B by some other data dependent quantity. So this is the idea of this Dirichlet sampling type of uh, algorithm. And then there is another family that was pioneered by uh, an algorithm in 2014 named BESA in 2000 um, by Baranzi et al. Where the idea is also to use some uh, sampling mechanism, but actually to do that when doing pairwise comparison of the means. So it's, it's thus, those are special algorithms that uh, in each round, they are not computing unindexed per arm, but they are 
comparing the arm that looks best so far, called the leader, to all the other arms. And to do a comparison, you could again think of the usual suspect, just compute the empirical mean of the two and decide whether the leader is better than the challenger. But this is very unfair because the leader has typically much more simpler samples than the challenger. So the idea is to make a fair comparison by removing on purpose some sample in the history of the leader to just have the same number of samples than the challengers. So there are many algorithms that use this kind of pairwise comparison with interesting uh, mechanism to subsample the history of the leader. So those are just a few references if you are interested or curious about this line of, uh, of work. So enough for advertisement of recent work. Let's uh, go back to the general conclusion uh, for this uh, uh, reinforcement learning uh, class. So what I showed you has actually, is actually several principles to balance exploration and exploitation. I guess so far you had seen only one, which is the epsilon greedy that everyone is applying in greedy. And uh, I convinced you on, in one of the first slides that, okay, for bandits, which are of course very simple in MDPs, this is not the most desirable algorithm. So the most interesting ones are the one using this very general optimistic principle. So whenever you are able to compute confidence regions on your model and not just point estimate, you can try to use a similar philosophy, even if computing an optimistic MDP might be harder than just computing the best possible uh, bounded problem. And then there are all these family of uh, randomized algorithms that are uh, extending this very interesting posterior sampling ID. Again, whenever you, are, you have access to a posterior distribution on your model or to a, something that generates plausible models, you can apply the idea of just drawing a possible model at random and then acting optimally solving your MDP with this parameter, solving your bandits with this parameter in the sample model. And as you will see in the uh, next classes of this today, uh, those two principles can be uh, extended to the more complex bandits that Claire will talk about tomorrow. And also it can inspire some exploration strategies that I hope Alessandro will also talk about tomorrow in his uh, exploration in RL uh, class. And also this afternoon, you might recognize a UCB in uh, disguise in uh, Tor lecture because indeed bandit strategy have also inspired this very powerful Monte Carlo tree search methods that are adaptively exploring uh, a search tree in a large uh, in a large space. So this is what you will uh, explore related to this class in the next in the next days. Thank you. <laughs> And yeah.